Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Screams from the Basement podcast with Sam and Casey. I'm one of your co-hosts. I'm Casey. Joined with me, as always, is my co-host on this podcast, Sam Lenz. How you doing, buddy? Man, I'm doing great. I've had some great reading over this past weekend. We've got a great guest on this episode, Casey. It's It's been good. How about you? Awesome, awesome, awesome. This episode's going to be a trip, man, because we are we're talking about... A, a, a novel that we both read. We're going to be interviewing the author right here, right now. We had an absolute blast with this movie, and we already warned our, our guest here, Joshua Milliken, that uh, we're going to just gush this entire time. So that's going to be one of those episodes, ladies and gentlemen. It's going to be a gushing episode. But first and foremost, let's introduce our guest, author of Teleportasm, Joshua Milliken. Joshua, welcome to the show. Thank you, Casey, and thank you, Sam. I'm so stoked to be here. And it's really my pleasure because, you know, for the past year and a half, I've been talking about this with the publisher and no one else. And now that it's been <laughs> released, it feels like the floodgates have opened and I'm just so excited to finally be able to talk to people who have read it and to really get in the weeds with this. Literally. Yeah. Yeah. Literally. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah we, we've been there. Yeah. Yeah. All right, I have to hit every time uh, I accidentally make a cannabis reference, right? There we go. There's the first one. First one in the interview. You could put a little you could put a little count in, in post-production. We could do a yeah. hit count. That's one. There's one. Well, Josh, uh, like the first first things first, like what what is that feeling like? Like you can talk about it now. We've read it to people out there. This is the you know, the book is already out. People are out there reading this book. You're already hearing reviews. Like, what's that feeling like right now? What what are you just feeling? Yeah, it is such a relief on a lot of levels. You know, imposter syndrome's real, even though this isn't even my first book. You know, you're always um, you know, afraid that you might have missed something that makes it terrible or it's just not gonna hit the way you hope it's gonna hit. So now that uh, even before it was released, we got some good early reviews. So I was like, whew, thank God. And I also have to admit, there was no small amount of anxiety related to the fact that this is the third entry in an established series. So there was already a tone and an expectation laid out before I arrived. I imagine it's how a, a director might feel coming into a franchise in the third or fourth installment you know but uh hearing people say that it holds up well with its siblings them being melonhead mayhem and candy cane kills really makes me excited because um, as you guys know um, teleportasm is part of the killer vhs series been described as a modern day goosebumps for adults and uh teleportasm just came out and there are two more coming out this year and uh, a sixth one was announced recently. That'll come out in 2025. And it's a wonderful franchise, literary franchise series to be a part of. Yeah, yeah. This, uh, the idea for this anthology is so cool. Um, can you uh, talk about the initial idea for Teleportasm and what, what essentially came first did you get approached to write something for this series or did you have an idea that you then pitched for this series and it's, how did that come about sure sure uh brian mccauley brian mccauley who wrote um candy cane kills he and i are both members of the los angeles chapter of the horror writers association so we met a couple of years ago after he and i had both just released our first books we we're first time novelists so we became friends we're talking I'm like, oh, what are you working on next? He's like, oh, Candy Cane Kill is part of the Killer VHS series. I had heard about the Killer VHS series, but you know, now I know someone who's actually writing it. And I was like, oh man, I got to get on that bandwagon. So um, he was like, yeah, you should reach out to Alan, Alan Lestufka from Shortwave. Um, and I was like, all right. And I formulated a little pitch in my head and uh, I sent it to him. And you know, I took the Killer VHS concept kind of literally where the VHS tape itself was somehow going to be killer, uh, similar to The Ring, but not in a supernatural way. And the way I first pitched it to Alan was Hellraiser by way of the Philadelphia experiment. And the, there's yeah, nice. video tape is kind of like the lament configuration, opening doorways to other dimensions. And that, you know, r radically evolved over time 
to the teleportasm that you've read and that was just released on the 25th. That's awesome. Um, that is a great way to describe the book. Um, I believe when I, when I was texting Casey while we were reading this, I'm like, it's almost like Cronenberg directed like a phantasm movie sort of thing. There's like this meld of all these different things that just comes together beautifully. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you my so favorite, much. Yeah. And you know, teleportasm is, is it's a subtle nod to phantasm. You know, I, I was trying to think of like a unique, you know, word that's kind of like a combination of words. Um, but it is kind of a nod to, to phantasm. And then the more I thought about it, the more it, it seemed an appropriate nod. Um, I love the, uh, the Cronenberg references. Obviously, Cronenberg was a big influence on this. Mm -hmm. You know, this is a teleportation horror story. And there are very few teleportation films and books um, on the horror tip, you know. Yeah. So um, it, it's a very niche subgenre. Um, but yeah, there yeah. we go. And you also, you also hit on a, uh, kind of like a, a hot topic in the horror genre right now. And it's like, everyone wants to have their own version of, Hey, this is, this is a drug addiction story. Whereas your, yours here deals with, again, these people are getting addicted to this VHS tape that allows them to teleport. And like, that's so just crazy and out there and weird. And, and it's so <laughs> much fun because like, the stuff, the stuff that happens to these people is just bad shit insane. And you're just having a blast and you don't care what you do to these people or not people <laughs> in this book as well. Yeah. Like what what was it like, you know, incorporating that element into into this story? Oh, it was it was a wonderful process. I do feel bad about what I did to Frankie. <laughs> she, she was the only one who had the insight she had a bad feeling about things and everyone just ignored her she did not deserve that but hey it, it's not a love story right um <laughs> you're right that the the um the concept that that alan and i came up with kind of together uh allowed for so many avenues of exploration and I really did kind of like throw everything, you know, against the wall, you know, imagine like post-it notes or a, 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 a whiteboard with all kinds of different things written. And then I just kind of wrote, you know, chapters pertaining to each, you know, and, and you know, I had this idea for a through story. And then at the very end, I, I came up with the idea of going back and linking everything together, but it was a ton of of fun. And let me tell you guys, there, there are at least two, maybe three, full chapters of teleportasm completely edited that we just took out. Um, not because they weren't good, uh, a little bit because we wanted to, to keep it to around 30,000 words, but um, also just because the same sort of, uh, we just felt there were so many other high notes that we didn't need anything that didn't just really hit really well. Um, so there's a whole chapter about the prom, for example, that gets referenced. Oh, damn. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, maybe Alan and I will release that uh, online somehow or in a magazine somehow. And there can be little uh, teleportasm, you know, offshoot stories out there eventually, perhaps. That would be awesome. That would be super cool. Yeah. Um, I love the way that this book is kind of like it's it's kind of like a novel in pieces. Like you've got you've got a lot of different um, offshoots to the point where it almost reads like an anthology. But like you said, there's that direct through line. Um, how did you like? What was your process for coming up with gore scenes? And how do you like? How do you evoke like? Making it such a such a hands on like you have something physical in front of you when you're creating a gore set piece. But this is all in your imagination. How did you go about? getting that into the written word the uh, way you so beautifully did because there were stomach turning moments in this man <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you i mean you know there were two things i was trying to do uh be funny and be gross so you know it was just a lot of going back and you know sharpening it and you know making sure the images you know really popped and making sure that i could you know see it when i read the words not just you know in my mind that i was that I was truly translating, um, you know, I, I, you know, going back to the Philadelphia experiment, 
you know, what's so scary about that, what everyone thinks about when they think of that is the sailors stuck in walls, you know, uh, mm -hmm. in, in these metal bulkheads, you know, uh, on the on the subatomic level, like groaning with pain, you know, so I was going to use that as the jumping off point. And everything I went from there had to take it in some sort of unique situation. It wasn't just going to be, okay, and now the same tape hits a new group of people and the same thing happens. It's not like that at all. And just to go back and address the uh, the pseudo-anthology quality of it, it's definitely a novel because you can't read it out of order. And even though yeah. the chapters, there are chapters that seem to stand alone, uh, they really don't because you need the chapters before and after them to really get the big picture at the end when you, you know, pull back and get the uh, the global view. Yeah, everything's a puzzle piece until the very until the very end yeah. when it all comes together and it's really yeah. Mm -hmm. The way you the way you tie together every thread by the end of it is is genius, man. It's thank great. you. Yeah. I mean, you know, thank you. You you absolutely flatter me. Uh, it, it was a it was a long process and it was a very collaborative process. You know, Alan and I uh, work together more than a writer and a publisher normally would, I believe, and it's because, like I said, the tone an expectation had been established. And so, you know, uh, I don't know if you guys have read any of my other, earlier work, it's much moodier, it's very glum, it's dark, it's psychedelic. And, uh, you know, I, I kind of had to put a lot of those uh, tendencies aside to really dip my toes into some new areas. So I've always been a fan of body horror and cosmic horror, um, but this is my first time trying to do it in a way that was going to entertain as much as it was going to, uh, evoke. Yeah. And one of the nice things about your book too, is like for us, this was my first book jumping into the killer VHS series. And now I'm like, all right, I need to read these other two. Oh, if, yeah, that's, you did. If, great, that's yeah. The if that's the tone, I'm, I'm 100% in, but again, yeah, I'm not, I, you know, I'm not lost in any of the story because it is very standalone. But it's also, I'm like, I want more. That was my first thing when I when I finished this book. I was like, oh my god, that can't be it. Like, where's, where's the next couple chapters? Like, I got to well, keep I mean, going. It like, does end on a cliffhanger, more. right? It, it ends on a, a cliffhanger, and and I love books that end on cliffhangers because even if they're never followed up, that just says that this is just part of a larger world, if not universe. Yeah. So there there are implied sequels in your imagination, but uh, you know, I wouldn't mind revisiting it. You know, if Teleportasm sells a million copies, I'll I'll get, you know, there will be further tales of the Teleportasm yeah. coming your way in 2025. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that would be awesome. Because, like, yeah, there's so many different avenues. And this is, this is like, a worldwide story that is kind of focused in this, like, one little little group that kind of has, like, these spider webs that tell all right, the other right. stories outside of it. But, like, this is a worldwide story, and you even have an entire chapter that is literally traveling back and forth across the United States. You even hit our state, you hit South Dakota and a couple yeah. of places <laughs> in this, which got a cheer out of me while reading it. So what, what, what was it like, you know, just like picking different, uh, you know, different landmarks to showcase in the, in teleportasm? Yeah. You're talking about chapter nine, welcome to dead world, which yeah. is one of the standalones. And it's one of the chapters that's been, um, getting the most attention and people have loved bringing it up and talking about it. You know, it's the story of um, a woman who finds herself in a, a different version of reality and uh, goes on a quest to make it all make sense. And, you know, s starts following signs uh, from coast to coast and back again, like you mentioned. And, you know, they go from like big landmarks uh, progress progressively, they go from these big landmarks, progressively darker, try that a third time, and then maybe <laughs> hit, the, hit the pipe again. Uh, she goes from finding clues at these big landmarks to finding clues in these smaller and more desolate places that all have uh, sinister implications. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I just wanted to hit everything and everything along the way. You know, I'm a big fan of urban legends and creepypastas which were explored in length. Um, the concept of urban legends and creepypastas are um, delved into in one of the earlier chapters. So I, I brought it out again for that one. But yeah, yeah. Welcome to Dead World is a very big chapter. It, it comes, you know, uh, it's almost like a mid second act shift 
Um, you know, it's where the story kind of breaks open. Um, and it's where there's a, a, a very uh, noticeable tonal shift. You know, it's not yeah. that all the, the humor goes away or anything, but um, it goes from being like silly and entertaining to uh, having much deeper implications. And that's, you know, like you guys pointed out, that's where everything gets more serious and where everything comes together. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, So the Dead World chapter is incredible, um, especially building up to the reveal at the end of that. Um, it's such a gut punch moment. Like it, and yeah, and I know. Up, yeah. up it's to so that point, like I wasn't expecting it, you know? So yeah. it just Thank like, you. it hits so hard. Um, Thank you. The other chapter that just got me was the Treehouse chapter. I love Can that. You, Can you talk a little bit about the Treehouse chapter? Because that yeah. that whole little segment of the book, I was just like, it was just nuts from, from yeah yeah sure well about that <laughs> first of all part of what what it was so fun for me about that chapter was writing dialogue for 12 year old boys trying to be yeah. both realistic and and entertaining um do i think 12 year olds would talk exactly like this probably not exactly like this but close <laughs> enough to where i think that like i really kind of um you know inhabited a vibe you know it's almost like you know uh, super bad for junior high school kids in, in some way but yeah like i mentioned before you know when you think of teleportation and teleportation horror you think about you know uh the philadelphia experiment and people attached to inanimate objects, walls, ceilings, you know, going through layers. And so one of the next steps for me naturally seemed to be, you know, what would happen then if you um, teleported into a living thing? And, uh, you know, this is kind of what would happen if the tape or a version of the tape you know, uh, found its way into a situation where people were going to um, find themselves in an arboreal nightmare. So uh, I don't mind, you know, uh, going into a little bit of spoiler territory because uh, I think it, it just builds so naturally. Hopefully readers will have as much fun with the dialogue and the characters in that chapter as I did. And yeah, in terms of, you know, really just milking that for all the sap and blood I could, you know, it was kind of just like going back through editing and revisiting those images and, and toning them down and sharpening them up and making sure that with two or maybe three sentences tops, I could really uh, paint a full picture, you know, in the mind where it's not just like, you know, uh, body parts in a tree. You know, I really wanted people right. to see these very specific repercussions. Yeah. 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 And you do such a great job of having these kids feel like like real prepubescence. You know, <laughs> yeah. they, they feel like kids that are that they're they're trying to sneak a you know a porno tape into their into their treehouse. They feel like kids that would definitely be trying to do that. And it feels like almost like monster squad almost. They feel like the kids from the night. Like if if they like found a VHS tape that had you know porn on it and uh, and, and yeah, they, but also they, like the like the the goosebumps part of it that you mentioned earlier, like yeah, that feels very goosebumps, but like oh, with a very like hard R edge to it. Yeah, exactly. Rated R goosebumps. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and like this entire book does have that feeling because like uh, both Sam and I were we were goosebumps kids, and like yeah. growing up now, it's like yeah, of course we can read those goosebumps books. That's fine. They're but they're meant for kids and everyone's going to be safe and happy by the end of it. You read this. <laughs> not, not, maybe not everybody's going to be safe and happy after this. No, but. it's more like a last person standing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there, there, there are points where without spoiling you, you like you tiptoe towards apocalypse. Essentially, Like you kind of toe that line between it being like a localized story and a, and uh, like, oh, this is a cataclysmic, world-ending type of situation. Potentially, um, yeah. Potentially, yeah. And I, yeah. So, can you talk about like, like it's a very human story. The four characters that you get attached to at the beginning, like by the end, you're still attached to them. Like everything that happens to them is is painful, you know. Especially after that first 
kind of act ends. Um, can you talk about like balancing having those core four characters while also creating such a widespread narrative and what that meant for you honing in on those four? Yeah. You know, for there, there were a few, uh, things that made these characters uh, very important. We're talking about Barry, Frankie, Snaps, and Lars. Uh, they seem mm -hmm. kind of like your, your typical everyday stoners. And, you know, there's a bit of me in every single one of those characters. And, you know, I, I base uh, a lot of their attributes on actual friends of mine. So they're there kind of to carry the thread through the entire novel. Um, it's like you said, they, um, you know, they, they have this experience that takes place basically over 12 hours and they don't realize that they've just changed the course of the world, potentially the universe, you know? So, um, and in between their story, you have these, uh, seemingly standalone chapters that give you a glimpse into the future at the repercussions before you get what is, you know, more or less a resolution. So, you know, they were the they were the personality. They're the emotional center. You know, um, if you can't see yourself in one of those four characters, maybe you at least knew someone who reminded you of one of those four characters. If you didn't sit around in a basement getting stoned, maybe you sat around with your friends watching Buffy or playing D and D or, or hearts or whatever. And you just remember those good, easy times. Um, you know, so caring about them was kind of important to keep people coming back invested to, to see, to see how that story ends and, you know, how, how, what they did ultimately triggered everything else. Um, so yeah, you know, they're important as, as, uh, the, uh, conceit that keeps returning and holding someone in. And they're also important as the emotional anchor, um, you know, I think that a lot of the characters in other chapters, uh, specifically Ophelia, uh, you do become very attached to them as well. Mm -hmm. But it's really, it's really about these four. And I, I think I said to you guys before, um, before we start recording, man, I feel like I did Frankie wrong. You know, <laughs> I like characters more and more as as the the novel came more and more to completion. And um, you know, while I knew it, it it was an R-rated nihilistic bleak story. I was never going to shy away from that. Like Frankie, man, you didn't deserve it. <laughs> You're the one who had the bad feeling about it all, man. They should have listened to you. If they had listened to you, maybe, maybe. But then again, her, her arc is interesting too, because as much as she was against it, as much as she wanted nothing to do with the tape initially, her, her life moving forward was completely dictated by the tape. Yeah. 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 I think that's what makes good horror though is like it's if you set up a character that we do not want to see horrible things happen to and then horrible things happen to them, there's where the horror is, you know. Mm -hmm. If Frankie's just an asshole, who cares by the end, right. you know? Yeah. <laughs> She's so cool. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, one, one, one other chapter I want to touch on, and I don't want to get too much in it because I want people to read this because I had a, a visceral reaction reading this chapter. And my wife was sitting next to me as I was reading. I was like, oh, my God, you need to read this like now. Um, it's the it's the fly chapter. It's, yeah. it's about this couple watching the fly, like literally taking what that supposed ending you know, the alternate ending of David Cronenberg's The Fly and literally putting into into this novel. Was that something like you came up as you were writing or beforehand where you're like, Oh my God, like I should put that into this and make it. Part Absolutely. Of this story. Absolutely. As I was writing it, you know, while I'm writing and while I'm refining and while I'm throwing all my ideas against the wall, of course I'm going back and I'm looking at, you know, the tiny niche that is teleportation horror and making sure I'm up to date on everything, you know, making sure that I can pay my proper homages. And so I can see how, you know, my predecessors tackled this very complex issue of teleportation, which I want to mention, uh, the, the science is very limited. There's like two teaspoons full of science way late in the book. So, <laughs> you know, if you can handle that, you're fine. But, um, so I, I did rewatch the fly, of course, you know, and the fly, I have such a, 
soft spot in my heart for The Fly because I saw it when I was very young. I saw it in a theater when I was too young to see an R-rated movie. And it knocked my socks off, scared the shit out of me, grossed me out. I, I hated it, but I loved it. And I couldn't stop thinking about it. And, you know, if you're if you're writing a teleportation horror, um, you've got to include some sort of nod to The Fly. So I knew that there was going to be some sort of aspect of that. So I'm watching The Fly. Excuse me. And um, there is that part towards the end. There's For those of you who have seen The Fly, you know, there's a part near the climax where, you know, before... Uh, Seth's transformation is complete. Uh, he corners um, uh, Veronica in his um, in his mad scientist lair, and he wants to put them each in separate telepods and have them fuse into a single entity, along with the unborn baby, which he imagines will be some sort of um, beautiful super being. You know, but of course he's loco. You know, he's he's lost his mind at that point. <laughs> So when I saw that and I remembered that, I thought, oh, that's it. I've got to write a story about what would happen if he had actually been able to do that. But of course, set it up in a way that fits into this new universe I've established, which is that there's this tape out there and copies of it that cause short distance teleportation. So, you know, I set up a, a situation where uh, a modern day mad scientist, if you will, uh, decides to give it a whirl. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's so gnarly. I'm not going to give away anything about it because I want people to read that chapter. But it's so Thank gnarly, you. and I'm like, that is yep. that is disgusting, and I can see everything in my mind, and that, that terrifies <laughs> me. What I'm seeing Thank in my you. mind. Yeah. Good. So, Josh, I got two more two more questions to throw at you before we sure. kind of wrap this thing up. I mean, the first one, first and foremost, like. Where can people buy this book? I think that's a big question. Where can people purchase this? Where can people uh, find this online? Yeah, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna do a quick teleportation thing here. Watch this. Do it. <laughs> oh my God, where'd he go? So you can order it at Amazon, Ooh. right? And it'll come it'll come in this you know stupid little uh, um, perforated bag, you know, that you just throw away and you do nothing with because it's garbage. I mean, maybe you use it to pick up other pieces of garbage, or you can order it directly from shortwave and it'll come in this crazy box that yeah. like nice. to the HS series. And then the book will be inside. And then uh, what do you do with this? A ton of things. You put your weed in it. Yeah. You, you put your lighters in it. You put your, your grinder in it. You, you save it. You put it on a shelf. You know, no one knows what's in there. So, you know, the, the short answer is you can get it pretty much online anywhere books are sold. But obviously you want the box so that you can keep all your weed utensils in there um, and practice the internal bulldog, internal bullfrog. Yeah. To your heart's <laughs> yeah. Hell yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, that's so cool. And the cover art for this is, is incredible. We haven't Mark even touched Bullchick. on that. Dude, yeah, it's Mark awesome. Bullchick. It's like... It looks like it's under a black light, even though it's not. It's so wonderful, and it fits the the mood and the feeling so well. Yeah, thanks for, for mentioning that, because um, I know for a fact that just something this evocative really goes a long way in, in getting people to actually purchase it and to want to read what's inside. So he's a fantastic artist. Look for more of his work coming up on additional shortwave releases. Yeah, that's awesome. awesome. That is awesome. All right, last question. I think it's 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 appropriate for yourself because you are uh yeah, obviously the author of the book, but you're also a horror massive horror fan, horror aficionado. You've written horror for a very long time. I got to ask, what would be your perfect double feature of movies to pair with teleportasm? If you're going to sit someone down, they read the book, you're like, "All right, you read the book. Now you got to watch these two movies because this is the ultimate teleportasm double feature what are those two movies well obviously the first one would be the fly uh because you know that is it's basically the wellspring from which uh, the concept of teleportation horror really came you know the other one being uh, stephen king's short story the jaunt you know those are kind of like two of the pillars so obviously you want david cronenberg's the fly the other one is one that was just on um uh, Joe Bob recently, Donnie Darko, because uh, yes. you, you want something where, uh, you know, these really crazy medical, metaphysical, cosmic issues are at play, 
but the characters are all just regular kids just trying to make it through their lives with the dating and this and that they don't they can't they can't even comprehend what's going on around them and i think that fits really well with what's happening not just to the four main characters but to everyone in the world of teleportasm yeah absolutely god i was so excited when joe bob played that it was like as soon as i saw the title i was like oh my god this is this is my night <laughs> yeah. Yeah, really bold too because some people will argue that donnie darko isn't horror and it's like come on man have you oh, seen that no. giant bunny like that's terrifying know, come on people exactly yeah come on yeah, yeah that's a great that double feature that is perfect yeah thank you movie camping in a parking lot for the first time and it scared the shit out of me <laughs> it's really unsettling you know? it is i don't think you can understand it unless you see the director's cut and even then you might need a, a you know whiteboard to kind of like visually see a tangent universe and stuff like that uh, but but not understanding it never mattered um yeah to my enjoyment of the film, multiple viewings, feeling emotionally connected with these characters. And, you know, I hope that, that, you know, readers will feel the same way. Um, they don't understand yeah. the mechanics of teleportation. When they first hear about it, they think that this is absolutely preposterous. They don't know how it works. They're just dealing with the fact that it is in their reality. Yep. It's a great double feature for a, a great book, man. Seriously, yeah. like this yeah. this book rules. We we both really we both really dug it. Yeah. You guys yeah. really humble me, and you know, after yeah. uh, writing this with Alan, just the two of us for so long, being able to talk talk about this book with people who have read it, and now that it's been released, not really care about spoilers too much. It's just been a real pleasure. You guys have really done. You know, a good deed to me, uh, allowing me to express myself, um, you know, having these podcast opportunities uh, is just wonderful. And having a chance to, um, you know, meet your viewers and potentially make new connections is is really awesome, too. Yeah, well, well, we we appreciate you coming on, Josh. This has been awesome. Uh, let's yeah. stay connected. And again, if people want to connect with you online and follow whatever you're doing, where can they follow you online? I guess best would be Twitter or Instagram. Uh, Twitter is uh, at Josh underscore Milliken. Uh, I'll keep you up to date on everything there. And there's a link to my YouTube channel. I forget I have a YouTube channel sometimes. <laughs> but, you know, uh, stay in touch with me on Twitter and I will uh, keep you up to date. Um, I'm also going to try to do more with the videos and, you know, share more about my personality and stuff. A lot of, a lot of the best horror writers these days are really doing a great job of connecting with their readers uh on a what feels like a face-to-face -face level yeah. so you know i'm gonna try to do more of letting people hear my voice and um you know know more about what makes me tick yeah yeah so awesome. josh thank you again man this has been awesome yeah, thank congrats you. on the book and uh we can't thank wait you. for our listeners to read it thank you you guys are awesome <laughs> thanks for tuning in to the screens from the basement podcast with sam and casey Please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. You can subscribe to this podcast on Apple, Spotify, and if you want the video portion, you can subscribe to us on YouTube as well. Pick up exclusive Screams from the Basement merch, including shirts, hats, totes, and so much more on our T Public store. You can use our Fangoria affiliate link for all of your Fango needs. You can use that to buy any magazines, t-shirts, and anything else Fangoria-related on their website. Please visit shop.fangoria.com slash screens from the basement and use promo code screens from the basement to save yourself 20%. And thanks for tuning in. And sweet screams. You're listening to the Prescribed Films Podcast Network, home to hundreds of hours of free podcast entertainment. The shows on this network all have a common goal, providing you with the best discussions about movies and other forms of entertainment media. The PFPN hopes to fill your ear holes with audio joy. Visit our website with links to all the other amazing shows at www.thepfpn.com. Thanks for listening.